It's good to see each and every one of you. Take your Bibles, please, and turn to the book of Leviticus, or is it Leviticus? Who do you think we're talking about? What tribe are we going to be emphasizing in Leviticus? The tribe of Levi. Those were your priests and the sacrifices. And we come to the book of Leviticus and you say, why? We're not under the old law. Jesus has fulfilled the sacrifices. But I think by the time you get finished with our study, you'll realize that every aspect of these sacrifices are fulfilled in Christ and you'll know why. Why does the trespass offering, the peace offering, the sin offering, the whole burnt offering, how does that relate to Christ? And we'll read in Hebrews 9, Hebrews 10 about all these, these uh, particular sacrifices. But what you'll learn in our study is that they had a distinct connection with God, with one another. And we speak about fellowship. Our fellowship is with God, and if you have fellowship with God and I have fellowship with God, then the meaningful fellowship that we have with one another is there. If I don't have fellowship with God, and you do, and we just agree on things, that's not going to help me any. The fellowship has to begin with God, and so there's these sacrifices that connect us specifically with God. But being connected with God, there are some sacrifices that are connected with somebody else. We will call that fellowship. And they're seen in these sacrifices. You'll be able to pick up on, on this. We'll, we're looking at a broad view of the book this, this evening, but one of the things I want to interest you in is that why it has some meaning for uh, me as a New Testament Christian is that I realize how much God's planning and what the concepts of those detailed sacrifices Watch the inwards. Don't, you, you take it outside the city, you, you, you burn the flesh and the dung, and, and then the whole burnt offerings, you cut them into pieces and you burn everything. Whole burnt offerings. Don't talk about burnt offerings, but the Bible will speak whole burnt offerings. What is, what is the significance of that? You'll learn that. Because we're going to study the book of Leviticus. And we begin, when we look at the very name of the book, here was the custom of the Jews in naming their books. It would at least be, it'd be the first word or the first phrase in the Bible. For example, how does, your, how does your Bible open in the book of Genesis? We know Genesis 1-1, don't we? There's a second grade class back here, and you'll learn that one, if you don't know that one. In the beginning, what did God do? He created, in the beginning, Genesis. And well, that, that fits, that fits with uh, in the beginning of all things. I don't understand that. But Leviticus? And the word denotes the idea he and he called. And he called, and that doesn't sound like Leviticus. I use the word Leviticus, and Leviticus. It's talking about the Levites. It's talking about the priesthood, the sacrifices. And it's truly doing that. But where the book fits in, is that God is in place with all of his tabernacle with Moses. And we see that at the end of the book of Exodus. And if you'll turn to Exodus 40, we'll be there in a moment. And when you see those events there, that he's in place, Leviticus, he speaks from the tent of meeting, verse 1. So God is calling from the tent of meeting when the book of Leviticus opens. And so we began to see how that, why that would be connected, and then we'll see why it's called Leviticus. But that's what we're observing. So in Exodus, the 40th chapter, and I want to begin reading with verse 17, because that will take us to the time of this book as well. I want us to look at what is being set up. The tabernacle is set up. God is going to be calling to begin the book of Leviticus, he's going to be calling from the tent of meeting. On the chart here, what would be the tent of meeting? That rectangular thing, the holy place and the most holy place. That's the tent of meeting. And God would meet him above the mercy seat. The mercy seat, as we'll see in this, is right above the Ark of the Covenant. It's the lid. That's what the word mercy seat means. It's a lid on top of the Ark of the Covenant. And that's where God would meet, inside that veil, right in front of the altar of incense. 
So let's pick up in chapter 40, and while I read, you mentally see, that's what the priest is. That's what they're doing there. This is what they're doing there. The tent of meeting is being set up. It came to pass in the first month of the second year. On the first day of the month that the tabernacle was reared up. So we got Moses rearing it up. He's getting it, everything in place. He puts the curtains down in those division places, and here we go. He reared it up. He spread the tent over the tabernacle, verse, verse 19, and put the covering of the tent above, upon it, and Jehovah command, as Jehovah commanded Moses. And he took and put the testimony into the ark. What's the testimony? The law. That's God's testimony. This is, I'm testifying this is the truth. And Moses had placed that in the Ark of the Covenant, where the mercy seat is, where God meets his people. And he says, and, and set the staves on the Ark. We know Sunday in our class with David, he learned. That was very important. Because when that was disregarded, the Ark of the Covenant would come falling down, the oxen and stumble, and all the events that happened with us and so forth, that, that took place. But here's where they set the way it ought to be. And the staves are on the ark, and they put the mercy seat of, above upon the ark, and he brought the ark into the tabernacle, and set up the veil of the screen, and screened the ark of the testimony, as Jehovah commanded Moses. So that line, perpendicular line, you get a veil there. It's a curtain. When Jesus was put to death, and the events that, that took the, the place in his resurrection and so forth, all the events are there, that, that curtain was, was ripped when he was raised from the, from the top to the bottom. No man did that from the bottom to the top. Access into the presence of God is now open because of the death and resurrection of Christ. These things are in place. They are teaching us of, uh, when things are going to be fulfilled in Christ. So that's why I want to study these things. They become meaningful to us. He put the table in the tent of meeting upon the side of the tabernacle northward. I wonder what that table is. The, the, the table on the north side of the tabernacle. What's up there that's on the north side of the tab uh, tabernacle? Showbread. It would be representing the 12 tribes, six and six, six stacks, six stacks, like pancakes. And they represented the 12 tribes of Israel. That would be God is representing his, his people. This is the people are being represented before God. It's the showbread. David would eat that. That was only authorized for the priest to eat. So these places, these things are in place. And we see the, the abuse that comes from it a little later, even in the Old Testament. And he set the bread in order upon it. That's why it's called showbread. Before Jehovah, as Jehovah commanded Moses, the 12 tribes of Israel are, bef are sitting before Jehovah. And that was renewed every week. He put the candlestick in the tent of meeting over against the table. He didn't lay it against the table, but it's against the table on the south part of the tabernacle. That's what it means against. You just, you, you take your eyes and it'd be oof, against, the, against that table. It's not next to it. That's where we talk. But when we realize that where things are, it's that lampstand opposite of the table of showbread. It's, up, it's over against it. It's on the south side. And that was lighted all the time, <laughs> evening and so forth, to bring, to bring light. He lighted the lamps before Jehovah, as Jehovah commanded Moses. And he put the golden altar in the tent of meeting before the veil. What's the golden altar before the veil going into the most holy place? The golden altar of incense. And as we shall see in Leviticus, the 16th chapter, once a year, that priest would go in and he'd apply the blood on the Ark of the Covenant and he'd offer up incense. The smoke of that incense would go on the other side of that veil where the mercy seat is. It's God's presence and he would feel that tabernacle this day. When everything's set the way it ought to be. And lights are lighted, showbreads there. The altar of incense is there. He burnt their own incense of sweet spices at Jehovah commanded Moses. He put the screen of the door to the tabernacle. That's going to the outside. And he set an altar of burnt offering at the door of the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, and offered up on it the burnt offering and the meal offering as Jehovah commanded Moses. We're going to be seeing what those 
meal offerings are. We're going to see what that burnt offering is. He's telling you what, it's going to, what, it's, what it is when he has set it up. And before that altar burnt offerings is where they would cleanse themselves. He set a laver before the tent of meeting at the altar and put water therein where went to wash. And Moses and Aaron and his sons washed their hands and their feet thereat. And, and when at and when it went into the tent of meeting, and when they came near unto the altar, they washed as Jehovah commanded Moses. He reared up the court around about the tabernacle. That's the outside rectangular boundary of, of the courtyard that we're seeing, the outer court. And set up the screen of the gate of the court. So Moses finished the work. And, he, and the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of Jehovah filled the tabernacle. Not his person, his presence. His glorious presence. Your name will be there, Jehovah, while you were in heaven. When Solomon would then have the temple. But here's, here is the plans for that, for the holy place of God, the tabernacle that Moses had. So you see, you see him lighting the lamps? Do you see him making the, the show bread? Do you see him offering the uh, smoke of the altar of incense, sweet savor unto God? Do you see him have the testimony inside the ark? Do you see where the mercy seat is, the lid? And this was indeed where, the, where God's testimony is. Everything is in place. Those staves to where you carry that ark is in there. As Jehovah commanded. It's kind of like the ark being built. As Jehovah commanded, Noah did it. And Moses did it on this day. It wasn't, it was never as pure as it's going to be today. We're looking at it, looking at it. What time is it? First month. Second year. Second year what? That doesn't help us. Well, you know, second year. Second year what? We're going to get back to our thinking on the Old Testament. We've been in Malachi. And way in, into 400 B.C., well, we're back, uh, we're getting ready to look at something that's written in 1500, 1445 B.C., in that particular time, B.C. And, uh, you know, a thousand years before these events that we're looking at Malachi, we've got to get back there. And, when, and the exodus of God's people out of Egypt, this was the second year in, in the first month. So when we look at... Leviticus. Why would this be? Uh, well, God called. That's the name of this book. Yeah, he's calling from the tent of meeting that has been set up by Moses that you and I have just witnessed him putting up. And he's calling from that. And who does it have to deal with? The Levites. High priests were from the Levite tribe. And all the ones that helped the priest were Levites. There's difference between priest and Levites. Priests were after Aaron. But here was the Levites, the rest of them. When we look at, when we look at the Sanhedrin court in Jesus' day, you'll see that the high priests were called rulers. Then you had elders. A lot of times they would be from the, the Levitical lineage, but men of, that had high honor among the Jewish people. They could be the secular part of that. And the religious people were, were the high priests and so forth. But there was a distinction between high priest and the idea of just Levites. I mean, it, I was preaching here when I found that difference. And one of the ladies in my Bible class, auditorium Bible class, brought that to my attention. I never, I thought they're all the same. I thought they preached and Levites, same thing. Because what I've been reading, priests came from the Levites. But not all Levites were priests. And she helped me understand the distinction and since then when I read my Bible it just pops out why didn't I ever catch that so that's why I come to Bible class too we we learn learn things but in the Septuagint it means that which pertains to the Levites is where we the Latin Vulgate is where we've taken that and made it Leviticus instead of God calling he, he called out with ten of meeting but it fits with this time frame because what we're looking at is the fact that here are the laws that the Levites were under, that they were to fulfill, and very, very distinct things they were to do. And that's where we do our daily Bible reading. Sometimes we get bogged down in those details. It's, oh, uh, that's it. Why do I have to know that? Have you ever looked, wanted to do research on something and you wanted source material? Now, you could go to the Torah, and, and good luck. 
because they had so much stuff to it. They had so many details. It was in his right hand that he held the gold, and he had that right, had the right hand of that. You're not going to read that in Leviticus. You're going to take he took his hands upon them. But they had details. Which hand was supposed to be what? What was to be in particular? If you thought these are details, wait till you read what happened with the traditions. And then you'll give up. But that's what Jesus was dealing with. You tithe and mint and anise and common, but you leave the way your matters of the law undone. You go on these de detailed things, and that's okay. Details is all right with God. He has a lot of details. He demands it here in the book of Leviticus. But I want you to realize that you're getting source material. You're getting it straight from Moses and not through the Pharisees. Sometime in your life, you need to get to the source and realize what Jesus was dealing with and how accurate Jesus was living according to the law that was given by Moses. As Moses commanded, you can't get any closer to God and, and the old law than that. Because he was talking to Moses to tell what he's supposed to tell to the people. And here was just dealing with the sacrifices. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. Do you believe that? I do. We call it the Pentateuch. Because that is the law and it's the idea of five books. So what would be the five books that Moses wrote? Genesis, Exodus, we've studied those. We're hitting Leviticus, new to most of you here. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. We got bogged down in that one too. We, we, all those numbers, all that. Why do we have that? It's, it's important. And Deuteronomy. Oh, that's the second law. But, but no, it's not a new law. It's teaching a new generation that same old law. And so a lot of that will come in the book of Numbers. Will, it will, will insect, will, will, I'll conflate those with the, with the times of, of, of the Levites, the Leviticus. And here's the reason for that, which shows that Moses did write Leviticus. For example, in Leviticus 1 and verse 1, we'll find that that. This is God's calling from the tent of meeting, verses, verse 1 and 2. And he says, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When any man of you offer an oblation unto Jehovah, ye shall, ye shall offer your oblation of the cattle, even of the herd, and of the flock. And he begins to talk about those in this first, first chapter. If you sin unwittingly, we'll get into that in lesson 3, where I wasn't willing to sin. It's not that, well, I never, uh, I, I didn't sin, I, I, didn't, I, I didn't sin with my will. Everything you do, you do with your will. You don't do it unless you will to do it. Like, now, don't bless holding a gun to your hand, go steal now, and I, I don't willingly do it. We're not talking about that. Unwittingly, see, I, I didn't mean to, but I did it. But willingly, says, I meant to. And there was a distinction that is, is being made that when you find out, I didn't know that was sin. When you're told it, it was sin, there's, there's, those will be these sacrifices that are being, being set forth uh, uh, unto us. Chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Jehovah spake unto Moses, saying, Speaking of the children of Israel, if a woman conceive a seed and bear a man child, then shall he be unclean seven days. 33 days after that, on eighth day, he'll be circumcised. 33 days after that, she'll still be unclean. That'd be your 40 days. If you had a baby girl, it's 80 days. Two weeks for that first uncleanness and, and so forth. But that was the specific laws about that. God is giving that to them. Leviticus, the 18th chapter, verses 1 and 2. It says, it's children of Israel saying to them, I am Jehovah your God. After the doings of the land of Egypt, he goes into Canaan. Don't do what the nations do around you. You're going to be set apart by this law. You're a holy people. We'll, we'll talk about that. But in the book of Leviticus, 56 times the Lord gives the laws to his people through Moses. He's, he's saying, it's coming through Moses. But he gave his laws. And Moses is the one that would write this book. How do I know that? Jesus says so. If you look at Matthew, the eighth chapter, and, and you see how Jesus applied the law as we go to the source material, and Leviticus 14, 1 through 4, he got exactly right. Without any additions or subtractions by the Pharisees. 
But in Matthew 8, he heals a man. There came to him a leper and worshiped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me whole. He asked for the miracle. Did he have belief that Jesus could do it? I get the impression he did. If you will, make me whole. Jesus says, he stretched forth his hand and touched him, said, I will be thou made clean. And straightway his leprosy was cleansed. Now that's not Leviticus 14, 1 through 4. It's this old ordeal of when the leprosy is, is departed. But this kicks in. Jesus said to him, see that thou tell no man, but go show thyself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded. Where did he command it? Leviticus 14, 1 through 4, for a testimony unto them. Where the priest could now say, this man is clean of leprosy. Jesus was willing for a priest to give that testimony to confirm what he had just done miraculously. Instantaneously, he healed a man of leprosy. And as Moses commanded, this whole book is God calling forth. God is speaking. He's speaking through his servant, Moses. And therefore, he is, he's bringing that uh, to them. So the time frame of this book, as we go back to Exodus 40 and verse 17, it was the first month of the second year. Well, I don't read that in Leviticus. Well, but what do we read it do in Numbers? Go to Numbers. When we, we study the book of Numbers, we know that Numbers starts off reading this way. Jehovah spake unto Moses in the wilderness in Sinai, ten of meeting, on the first day of the second month, in the second year, they were come out of the land of Egypt. I know what the second year is now. You do too. It wasn't the second year of the common era. It's the second year of coming out of Egypt. They're there for the end of Exodus to set up that tabernacle and start things in motion. And you got the book of Leviticus, and then right after it, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, then you got Numbers. And by the time you get to Numbers 13, have they started their wandering journey yet? Their 40-year wandering? No. Because that's when they sinned with their lack of faith, and that's why the punishment comes in Numbers, the 14th chapter, and they're going to be going for 40 years. So the tent of the tabernacle, God is speaking out at the end of Exodus, the first of Numbers. I think this book is right there too. Because it's going to tell them how to set up things when they go on their way in Numbers, when they're going to depart from getting, having the law. Moses has given them the law. They set up the tabernacle. So we're setting now the requirements of the priest, the characteristics of, that should be seen in them offering up their sacrifices. It was very distinct and very important. And we'll be reading. We, don't, we look at it now, but we'll read through there the the fire from the burnt offering that was to be offered every morning, every evening. The fire of that altar that we talked about being in the outside of the, of the holy place. The fire never went out. The fire was never to go out from that altar. Sacrifices were being offered. I know a burnt offering was offered every morning, every evening. And he even states the fire was never to go out. Where did Aaron's sons get their fire? Where the fire went out for about three, three days, it never went out. That's where they were to get their fire for their incense burning. They got it from a place that God hadn't commanded. Okay, let it go. He struck them dead. He struck them dead. And... That's what God thinks of presumptuous sins. I presume it'd be okay with you, God. After all, we're burning incense, aren't we? We're offering sacrifices, but they may not be what God has prescribed. So we're looking at the details. We're, we're, getting, we're getting firsthand information as, as far back as we can get it to when it was given to Moses that we can interpret things and realize, Jesus, you didn't sin when they accused you of violating the law, violating the Sabbath. 
And so I kind of know when this book was written about that same time. So we're talking about the middle of the 15th century B.C. What does B.C. mean? It means before Christ. That's the way most scholars and historians, that's how they used to give us the time. What is A.D. in the year of our Lord in Latin? That was connected in the year of the Lord when after Jesus was raised and here's the events that, 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 that took place and then we come back and realize the year of our Lord, he probably was born in 6 BC, which would be confusing to some of you, but that's uh, between 4 and 6 BC he was born. But in the year of our Lord, we, we, we denote time. We don't do that anymore. You read your books, you read your uh, secular history, and, and you, you realize that for a long time, historians have taken Jesus out of history. And it's uh, CE. It's B, it, you know, it's, it's uh, four CE. Uh, the, or BC, before the common era. Common era. <laughs> it, it wasn't special with Christ. And we say, well, how could that happen? Well, it just happens when people determine to do that. And so you, you try to find you try to find modern history books that have B.C. in it. And most of it will be in the common era of our Lord. Of, of before the common era or, or after, after the Lord came, they'll be in, in the common era that we tell, tell time. And that's sad to me. But what's happened in Finland today? You got two people in parliament that consider themselves to be Christians. And they're standing up for, for Christian beliefs and values. And they're getting ready to be punished and put in jail. And all they're doing is, is speaking up for values that we say with homosexuality, what, whatever the issue is. And we can either be quiet and let error continue and let darkness continue, or we can shine. But it's getting very hard to shine. But here are two people, partner, they're taking it on. And they're asking the American government, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, Finland. I used to have... A pen pal in Finland. I thought it was a great country. But it's become secularized. Europe has become secularized. Canada is secularized. It used to be in the 50s you had people going to church, like 60 some percent, now it's 10 percent. And you wonder why countries could be like they are. And we, we live, we're living in a time where we realize I can see where Christians could be put to death. <laughs> well, why did they do that? They were good people. Read about it in the New Testament. But the secular world despises the things of God. And we've seen people now that are so crazy, they, you don't disagree with them, they will cancel you. And, and again, that's what Jesus is saying. That if you're angry with your brother, you consider him not worthy to be living. Uh, it's not too far of a step to kill him. And Jesus would conflate those together. Uh, the fact that you're not, you, know, you don't commit murder, you, you, you'll be that kind of angry. That's a moron. You don't have that kind of attitude about someone else. And to have that kind of hatred. Because when you've got the power to completely demolish a people, the second world will do that. And so we've got to keep shining. So here's the middle of the 14th century. Uh, we've got B.C., you know, 1445 B.C., before Christ came that's the way we're going to tell time and that's kind of when this book was was written let me give you two structures We've got 27 chapters and what you see is that in the the book i think in my outline i'll, I'll have chapter 18 twice and don't, i don't mean to do that but in chapter 1 through 17 is the basis of israel's walk with their sacrifices and then beginning with chapter 18 through 27 is the holy walk with god and all of a sudden we'll see like leviticus 19 2 be holy because I am holy. These first, these first 17 chapters are simply just giving the characteristics of the different type of, of sacrifices that the priests were to offer. It talks about their work. But then we, beginning in chapter 18, we see an emphasis kind of changing that the reason you need to apply these to your life is that you're a holy people. And you be holy as I am holy. Look at Leviticus 19 and verse 2. 
because this, this comes in this section. This, this is kind of stands out in these last chapters. Speaking to the, all the congregation of the children of Israel, Moses, he's speaking to him, and say to them, ye shall be holy, for Jehovah your God am holy. And it's in a connection with God's law. Fear every man his mother and his father. You shall keep my Sabbaths. I'm Jehovah your God. Turn you not to idols. Make yourselves molten gods. Don't do that. I'm Jehovah your God. You need to live holy and apply that law. Because you're serving a holy God. What does holiness have to do obeying my parents? Everything. He set us apart. Read Romans 1 where one of the designations of a, of a society that had no knowledge of God and no reverence for God is they were disobedient to their parents. Look at Leviticus, the 20th chapter, verse 7. He says, Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy, for I, Je I am Jehovah your God. You shall keep my statutes. They're going to be the ways that you are, are sanctified. We come to verse 26 of the same chapter. Ye shall be holy unto me, for I, Jehovah, am holy, and have set you apart from the peoples, that you should be mine. So, I'm looking at how to walk with God according to the law. But the first 17 chapters, details, sacrifices, things that priests are supposed to do. But verses, chapters 18 following, we get to see how that is applied in our lives. Now, look at Leviticus 18.5 with me for just a moment. I want to ask you, does this bring to your mind a New Testament passage? Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my ordinances which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am Jehovah. We're dealing with this theme, I am Jehovah, I'm holy, therefore you ought to be holy. But he makes this point, he didn't say about being holy, but you shall obey the statutes, that's how we'll become holy, which if a man do, he shall live in them. Anybody... Have a passage come to mind? All right. Turn me to Galatians 3 and, and verse 12. And how would you now interpret Galatians 3, 12? When you know what the passage said in the Old Testament, the importance of the law, how would you interpret this? And you're going to give meaning now because we're going to pick up reading verse 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse, for it's written, Cursed is every one who contendeth not in all things that are written in the book of the law to do them. Now that no man is justified by the law before God is evident. For the righteous shall live by faith, and the law is not of faith, but he that doeth them shall live in them. Does that sound familiar? What's the point? Paul takes us back to Leviticus in the context of one of the major divisions of the book of Leviticus. That if we're going to do God's law, we're going to live in them. That means we're living out what God has commanded. Isn't that the only way we could ever be justified by law? That's his point. No man is justified by the law. The only way you can ever be justified by the law is that he that doeth them shall live in them. You usually think, if you do it, you're going to be alive in God. If you live in, you'll be able to live with him. Well, there's truth to that, and nobody lives up to that. But I think the point is, the reason we're not going to be doing it, because if you're going to be doing them, you're going to have to live it out in your life, and these people aren't doing it. None of us done that perfect, perfectly. So it, it helps you be distinct in your interpretation of the New Testament. Well, well if, you, if, you live, if you do the word of God, you're going to live, and, he'll, and he'll, he'll make you righteous. Okay. Next step is that, did you do that perfectly? No. Well, law's not going to help you, any, is it? Why don't we get to the point? That's what Paul's making here. You don't do that because if you do them, you'll live in them, and they're not living in them. They're not doing all that the word has written, the verses before that. That's contextual studies. And that will never change. Why not get the thought straight? And if we don't read our Old Testaments, we may not get that background that helps us to know our Bibles better. Fellowship. 1 John 1 and verse 8. 
It kind of sums up what we're beginning with verse 5 about fellowship with God and the, and the necessity of following his, his laws. Back up to verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and we'll walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in light, we have fellowship one with another, meaning myself with God. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. That's my relationship with him. Thanks, thank you. If you say that you have no sin, you deceive ourselves. We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. We all sin. So the only way we could be right before God is keep the all law, all of it, and keep it perfectly. We haven't done that, so we need a Savior. I've got, God is no, has no darkness in him at all. How could I ever be in fellowship with him? Jesus Christ. He's going to fulfill all of these, these, these offerings. And that's what we're going to be, to be looking at. I know our time is limited, but let, let, notice some prominent subjects. There are five offerings. Could you name them right now? The five offerings that we're looking at in this first part of Leviticus. Let's think about them. Where would you start? Let's start with, with, with burnt offerings. What would be another one? You can cheat if you want to. I'm not, that's, not, that's not fair. You can look if you want. It's nobody cheating. Bur burnt offerings. Meal offerings and meat offerings. Let's put the, the, those to, together. You got peace offerings. Sin offerings. And trespass offerings. Well, you mean all the rest of them are not dealing with sins? Well, I don't know. What's the difference between a sin offering and a trespass offering? Hang on. It's steady. You're going to learn. And what you find is that here are the burnt offerings and just, just kind of hopefully whet our appetite. Why are they called whole burnt offerings? And how did Jesus fulfill that in Hebrews 10? Whole burnt offerings that I would not have because I would have given it to you. <laughs> you know, why did they offer burnt offerings morning and evening? And the fire never went out. I came to do thy will, O God. I'm the best burnt offering you could ever have. And I satisfied the burnt offering section of what you've given man to do. And why they're called whole? Because we're completely dedicated to God. That was the burnt offering. That's the concept. And it was never, to the fire of that burnt offering was never to go out. And that was to be offered day and night, day and night. Because we're totally dedicated to God. You be holy, because I'm holy. And when a Jew was involved, here, here was the, the tabernacle grounds. You could go morning, you come evening. And that burnt offering, whole, whole burnt offering, all of it was being burnt on the altar. I read a book a long time ago and I started preaching. And it just stayed with me about the tabernacles. The blood never dried at the altar of God. Blood was always flowing with sacrifices. And you see how many sacrifices they offer. We've seen that in, in Numbers and Deuteronomy and so forth. And see how, how many sacrifices were offered for the feast days and so forth. The blood never dried, the fire never burned out. Because there was a continual need to be sanctified by blood. But we know blood of bulls and goats can't take away sin. Who did? Jesus Christ. He satisfied the burnt offerings. Peace offerings that are said. We'll see that sometimes they were given as a vow. Sometimes they were given as, a, as, as a thanksgiving. And just to show the dark side of things, and you begin to understand when that lady is tempting a young man to have fornication with her, she said, I've offered up the vow of my, of my peace offerings today. Would you come and eat them with me? You'll write in Leviticus, I better because she can't partake of that offering the next night. You eat them then, and the next day, third day, you couldn't eat them. I guess I need to go to her apartment tonight and help her uh, enjoy the peace offerings. They were to be shared with others. There's your fellowship. And your meal offering, you would offer a portion of that to God, the rest of it the, the, the priest would eat. There was a sharing aspect of sacrifices. Fellowship with God and fellowship with one. I'm offering part of it to God. I'm having fellowship with other people. 
And here was an adulterous woman who was unfaithful to her husband. And here was the simple boy, young man, that was, came too close to her door. And she pulled that. The religious aspect was put into his mind. I guess I better need to go up and help her you know, eat that sacrifice with her. It's a godly thing to do on his way to ruin. What's the difference between trespass and sin offering? They're both sin offering, but let, we'll, we'll have to stop. Trespass offerings were things that are specific sins that I've wronged a brother in. I need to add a fifth part to that. Sin offerings were the, the fact of, of sin before God, but you had the trespass offerings were very distinct sins that we'll talk about that were, that were looked upon there. So every one of them had a, a, a different meaning, a different idea about those, but you'll read the passages here that we'll see those in these first uh, few chapters. And you'll get a feel of how they were being used and what belonged to the priest and what didn't, how they were to be offered. And uh, I hope that will be helpful and instructive. Thank you.